Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the final Holloway reading of the, of the fall semester. I'm Cecil Giska, I teach poetry here. We're fortunate to have with us this evening Tom Picard, and uh, we're also fortunate to have, uh, to have uh, Leo Dunsker, who is a graduate student in the program here, and he will uh, give a, a brief reading before, the, uh, before Tom uh, reads. Um, this is the final reading for the, for the fall. Come back in the spring, and you'll hear Cedar, Sigo, Cedar Saigo, uh, Andrea uh, Brady, Aditi Machado, and Chris Nealon. Uh, and uh, Jess Lasker is going to uh, introduce Leo Dunsker, and uh, then David Swinson will introduce Tom Picard. So, uh, uh, Jess, if you would. Can everyone hear me? Leo Dunsker, with his characteristic mix of rigor, irony, and enthusiasm, once pointed out to me an instance of awkward translation in Adorno's Minima Moralia. It reads, with typical Adornian pessimism, sociability itself connives at injustice by pretending that in this chill world we can still talk to each other. I'm gonna read it one more time. Sociability itself connives at injustice by pretending that in this chill world we can still talk to each other. To anyone familiar with a certain Californian vernacular, this chill world perhaps reads differently than Adorno meant it. I would go so far as to wager that for Leo, unlike Adorno, it is not the world's coldness that makes sociability a lie, but its laxness, its being frankly just too chill, insufficiently vigilant, too slow to get the joke, without enough gravitational pull to keep things aloft and circulating in its orbit. The poems that result from such a sensibility exercise those parts of the mind that might be lost to such a chill, keeping us in their orbit, aloft, on our toes. Leo will read his poems to you, but I'm going to ask you to picture them. They are bite-sized, on average three to six short lines long. Their titles all in caps, many to a page. They refuse you the chance to relax into them because, in a sense, they never relax themselves. They have no soft middle. They are all the flash of title, first line, brief context, last line, new title, first line, etc. The poems are propelled by juxtaposition, refusing to pretend that in this chill world, lines can presume any narrative continuity with each other. It is as if they say, now that the 20th century has happened to poetry, why would I break a line when the line has already been broken? Leo's poems strip poetry down to some of its most contemporary pleasures, while at the same time remaining suspicious, ashamed even, of rejoicing in such pleasures. And if it seems shameful to giggle at the California chill inside the cold Second World War chill of Adorno's world, then the better for Leo, who shares with Plato a suspicion that the unseemly is precisely that which unites the private with the performative, making it possible to write a poem. I'll stop as soon as I read you a part of the epigraph to Leo's collection, Life of a Man, which comes from Plato and says this. There is a principle in human nature which is disposed to raise a laugh. And this, which you once restrained by reason because you were afraid of being thought a buffoon, is now let out again. And having stimulated the risible faculty at the theater, you are betrayed unconsciously to yourself into playing the comic poet at home. Please welcome our resident comic poet, Leo Dunsker. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. 
Uh, yeah, so can everyone hear me? Everyone can hear me? <laughs> um, so thanks to Jess for the astonishing introduction and to Tom for being here tonight. Uh, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm going to keep my talking to a minimum. We'll be done in about 10 minutes, uh, at which point I'll disappear for a bit. But <laughs> thank you all for your time. <clears throat> Seeing the elephant. Take these ribbons from my hair, shake me loose and let me fall. All I'm taking is your time, morning shadows on the wall. One of things equal to another, here we have the Roman feeling. The visible world grows once more smaller, I knew you then and now you're calling. Sports Illustrated. The things you've killed are a natural language. I took it personally because it was personal. Him to second order evil. James Fenimore Cooper, his novels show a sense of the Western frontier, leaving now this world of Maya, whatever those words of mouth allow, it's no secret I was the second order evil that you were wondering about. The person I like. Sometimes I get up and sometimes I don't. What does this line mean? Buy the poem and find out. <laughs> Small beer. Leaving through the window, tell a lie not to be missed. It was the night of the fourth hour of night, heartbreak crumpling, dreamt you were well. Do you accept the changes? Don't really know how to drive. Don't have many friends in Texas. He said, you have to be the knife. <laughs> Troilus sees the enemy. He has chosen not to choose, waiting for that wheel to stop. All the others knew it too, turning gently from the fair. Think of freedom, can't stop crying. One way. Here's the pattern again, understanding what's been said. Okay, now for a behaviorist reading. The lover is one way all the time. You should talk more to people. Compared to love, what's so bad about a novel? You don't have to believe in God, but you still have to go to hell. He began again, I'm that friend who... The sign of knowledge in our time is divorce. Three years later, you smell the fire, having longed to see the enemy. Nothing gets better until you approach the divorce. Tonight, there cannot be divorce, and I am reading, let us now praise famous men. It could be botulism. People are always sitting down and writing out of nothing. Nothing strange about it. When I was in seventh grade, everybody hated me, but I had options. <laughs> Love on the farm. <laughs> oh my god. What large dark hands at the window, grasping in the waning light. A wild boar walks across the lawn. The wound of love goes home. Tell me the Lord is not on his way. <clears throat> Some say no. Tomorrow, which means plenty more, of the love that can be reckoned. I laughed him out of patience, was innocent at the sentence, a whole day lost to the heavy ghost, less without and more within, such custom then as winneth most. That's Luke for you. In the dream, my friend has died, not of syphilis. Everyone is screaming downstairs, my God, I could be on this list, call up your former partners. That's Luke for you. The understandable enemies. Impropriety comes easy. The innocent could suffer forever. Once more it was the understandable enemies. Lancelot and Guinevere. Remembering it this way, success was the exception, just like today, which is understanding as a place to be safe after the great pain, a semi-formal feeling comes. 
as you demand of me so wonderfully little. The particularities attached themselves to the individual voice, and so the joke was ruined. It was already happening, you knew that. Behind you, the sad park and the children. The psychological novel. The sorrows of a saintly thing, looking upwards for to know, it's the loveless keep on searching, making light of the dead again, in the muzzle of efforts increase, half the fight is knowing when. Why feel sorry? In the dreams of my friends, I am crying on the phone. The last years are the last years, how it ends with the sorrows of the lonely and the burning of the dancers. John Greenleaf Whittier. In the winter, one is neat. Go to the mountain, quarrel at the steakhouse, what you say and later hear. I am asleep beneath the fig tree in the first lunar month. This is the story of my victory. Marjorie Kemp. Saw him in the street, in the street. Man's life, such a very small matter, it was turning openly, I would say rather. Sublime simplicity, I would say rather, discretion. Scenes from the gig economy. Edward Sally, his book shows that he is worried. The spirits who would steer him away from love at the grocery store buying new potatoes. Self-immolation is on the news today. Call down curses on the devil. Trouble finds you out. Bargaining for the homecoming. I am interested in money, how it is and is not. Muscle Shoals, California will not know what hit it. And why not? As a child, it took me years to go to bed. The point is to change him. Wristwatches with the second hand moving in the beginning was the world, and they didn't know the difference. Thinking yes, or maybe finally, now this is what tragedy is like, the later actors, what resembles them. And I am the evil man who walks these hills, who no longer fears the world, which hates itself, which loves the flesh. Nice. <laughs> the nice man cometh. <laughs> Throwing heat like Randy Johnson, the big unit. Between us, we never ended it, it just went on and on. A 99 mile per hour fastball is no joke. You break free of the abyss, move among us still. Everybody loves a winner. Visions of Omission Street. To feel you in the dying season, with the hooded crows all calling, a lack of name, but then again, I went with thee, although past caring. To think not of being good, but rather of the good life, it maketh me to lie down in darkness with the world as my wife. Nature habit milieu. Whereas some people are born with good character, God appeared to him and said, you are eating too much. <laughs> <laughs> the Great and Sober West. The exhaustion of embarrassment, or its opposite, taking hold. Sometimes it leaves you the fastest cars. You only said you didn't try. But in the giving, one cannot. It never entered my mind. Go now, buy another sandwich. Today you die, tomorrow you get arrested. Woke up, put my shit on backwards. Things for money. As a child, I was not weak. I am optimistic that I can exist in the world without being weak. These days, I am two people who love each other. We excel in assumption and deception. That's what I call music now. Good time religion. Roll me over in the bed, the book you asked for on the floor. I guess you won't, I guess you will. Good to know it's ending soon. Hard to see how far you've come. The golden trains that carried you. Last one. Leaving the ministry. 
Self-control as empathy with your future self. Temporal selflessness merged the two viewpoints into one. You're showing dark traits again. What's going on tonight? I'm tired of living. Do you have a mom? I just wanted to get his mind off of what was bothering him. You're not in trouble. Love as pure relation. Nostalgia as relation to purity. I read, played softball, and played pool. I liked pool and was pretty good at it. The other girls in prison gave me a hard time that I was gambling. My first experience on public transport was taking the bus to the gym. I cried the whole time. Desire was everywhere. Thanks again. Everyone. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to Tom Card and Leah. That was wonderful. Um, hope you can forgive the laptop printing in this department. It's a recurring nightmare. <laughs> it's a pleasure and a privilege to be introducing Tom Picard, a poet whose strengths are so various and rich that, and this is really no empty phrase, it really is difficult to know where to start. If I had to choose a place, it might be Newcastle upon Tyne, where Picard was born in 1946, and with which he is associated as a strong voice in the history of his poetry. But the city of Newcastle and Picard's work is more than merely a locale or an autobiographical background. It seems to me that it becomes a kind of flexible lyric geography across which language, identity, and lived experience unfold. From the earliest book, the 1967 High on the Walls, through to An Armpit of Lice, Dancing on the Fire, Domestic Art, The Order of Chance, Shedding Her Skirts, or the more recent, The Ballad of Jamie Allen, published by Flood, or Hoyut, Collected Poems and Songs, Picard's work demonstrates a strong evasion to generic pigeonholing and a commitment to a skepticism of artifice that does nothing to compromise craft. As the critic Kenneth Cox wrote, the northeast of England has together with a deep distrust of artifice a strong tradition of popular song. To the dignity, militancy, and ribaldry of its industrial ballads, Picard adds a personal zest as well as emotion and craftsmanship far beyond their range. Local words, slang, dialects of the north form a critical element of the linguistic texture of Picard's work. But also, this doesn't quite do justice to the truly international poetic scene that he, along with his mentor Basil Bunting, helped to foster. Three years after leaving school at age 14, Picard met Basil Bunting. In his own words, he, quote, spent most of his adolescence and young manhood taking advantage of very long periods of unemployment to develop some writing skills under the generous tutelage of Basil Bunting. Part of this mentorship and tutelage unfolded during the time in which Bunting was to publish his masterpiece, Brig Flats, and during this time, Picard helped found the Morden Tower Poetry Center, which would play an integral role in linking communities of poetry across the world, quite famously between America and the UK. The first reading of Brig Flats, in fact, took place in the Morden Tower on the 22nd of December, 1965. And over its long lifespan, the center played a core role in what came to be known as both the British poetry rival, while it also hosted a wide and stylistically diverse variety of poets such as Allen Ginsberg, Ted Hughes, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Liz Lockhead, Robert Creeley, Seamus Heaney, Gregory Corso, and Ed Dorn. This exchange, which was fostered between varieties of UK and American poetries, is, I think, a very strong moment in the literary history of exchange between the two countries. It resulted in poets like Zukofsky and Nadeker being absorbed across the pond. But in addition to this, I'd like to highlight the commitment Picard's work demonstrated early on to resisting the dominant conservative categories that were being enforced by the movement poets in England. These are both things that can help us understand how important Picard's work is to the poetry of the North, the poetry of England, and a much broader international community of readers. In 2007, Ballad of Jamie Allen was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, and his last three books, Hole in the Wall, The Dark Months of May, and Ballad of Jamie Allen, have all been published in Chicago by Flood Editions. His part autobiographical, More Pricks and Prizes, was published by Prest Wafer in 2010. Picard is a poet whose strengths are associated with a singular place, but some of my favorite poems of his take place in America. For example, I'll end with a poem he wrote called NYC. In a room of mirrors, a broken glass, we dance. What instrument are you? A flashbulb every three seconds. Your hand on my knee, my tongue in your ear. If we whisper, they can hear. I hope you'll join me in welcoming Tom Picard. Um, 
thank you for that kind of introduction and, uh, and for having me here. Um, if I'm, I'm kind of uh, jet lag, so if I fall asleep during this performance, throw something at me. Preferably money. <laughs> Paper money, because I'm a light sleeper. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to start off reading some poems from uh, Fiend's Feld, um, which I, uh, I'm just going to set my tongue now, if you give us a sec. Uh, is that, okay. Um, I, I spent 10 years living in this um, cafe, remote cafe, uh, on the top of the North Pennine Hills. Uh, when my marriage was stopped, I sort of went there to lick my wounds, but it was also the cheapest accommodation I could find in that location, which was known as the last wilderness in England, you know. Um, so, uh, and I kept journals uh, throughout that 10 year period, and um, I didn't quite know what I was going to do with them, but I just thought of the the, the random way you make an entry into a journal that I suppose because of my ADHD I'm sort of incapable of kind of you know doing the grunt work to write a novel or something or uh, so I just thought the ran randomness of it where you make an entry you know like a, a diary entry or just whatever you're thinking about or what you're seeing as you walk around the place. So, and, and I thought that a form would evolve itself out of it. Um, so, whether you think so, it's another matter. Um, but anyway, it ended up with this. And I'll start with this. As I walked up John Street, thinking of you, I saw a slash of sea between houses and felt, as always, no matter mood, it's or mine, something before thought, as though it were the source of language, and language the source of itself. This is prologue. When my lover became my enemy, I made a bed amongst winds and drove the old road till my heart crashed. Where's the bypass? Midsummer, a blood-coloured star above the swell of a reclining woman, backlit by sun sunk behind skunk hills at midnight. Um, it's, the book's composed, you know, there's more prose in it than poetry, and um, I haven't really rehearsed reading the prose, so I'm probably mostly going to just read it in poems from it. Anabatic. At first they recce easy around the edge of breath, then gathered gangs on leash and breach, but the wind has no objectives, riding the slope of my roof. So, I don't know about you, but uh, occasionally I get a phrase which I think, oh, you know, what am I going to do with that? And one such phrase that came to mind was, I thought it kind of summed up the, the whole day, was um, the whole sweep of the day. Anyway, this is for Bob. The whole sweep of the day. If I were Creeley, I'd know what I meant and make it a poem. But I'm not, and I don't, and I have. <laughs> <laughs> So sometimes, um, you know, I compose poems in my sleep, or songs, and this is one. She said she would not dwell in the heather on the fell beneath the down upon my bed, and all the words she said. I saw the midnight waters rise, the colour of her eyes. I'd rather be an old stairwell and feel the weary tread than be an unsprung mattress on your old cold bed.
Claws of cloud grip a far hill, topped in snow. The emptiness of winter fells, a red and crooks. As it comes in and goes out, the day opens and falls back on itself. You can't help but be in it. New Year's Day, the blizzard's blown out, snow blows, go below, sun white, watch hill. A grouking raven grows, my first foot flying past. I, um, I fuck what I'm doing, let drink. Um, yeah, so I, I, when I was writing this book, uh, which is really useful, and I'm, I'm writing volume two now, uh, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, as I, I, as I got so old, and I figured out all of the things I was interested in, and all the projects that I've been working on for years and gathering notes for and researching on, and I probably would never be able to finish them. So I found this form, you know, uh, that I could actually, it was just like a big <coughs> bucket, and I could pour everything in and stir it around and see what came out. Anyway, so I was writing uh, some memoirs uh, for this book, and I was struggling to remember a word. I couldn't, I was grasping, struggling for a word. I just couldn't recall the word I was looking for. And believe it or not, the word was amnesia. Hmm. <laughs> uh, so I wrote this. Nectarine. I forgot, forget. Amnesia was lost to me. Then a smooth, fur free fruit, unnamed for days, until I found it ripe on my tongue. Clouds shift. Shiver out the sun, a slanting sheet of sleet driven over the fells from the east. 9th of February, flight, night rides up long slopes, mist fills the valley, overlapping greys patch a hungover sky, the faint curve of a distant brow, wind racked rains insist my glass. Then of February, a rabid dog on a long leash leaps, howls lurching through power lines, lashing fast and pugnacious a punch drunk heavyweight on speed. I became totally obsessed with winds because this cafe that I lived in was a biker's cafe um, and it was totally exposed to the elements. It was right in the edge of the escarpment and these unbelievably ferocious winds just continually bombard the place. Um, 12th of February, late at night without a coat and the wind still raging, an old woman from the cottage hospital in Alston banging on the deserted mortuary window, demanding entry, convinced she is home. Night blows up from the valley, Dykes dissolve in thick fog. I follow my feet home. So this is a, a little mix of um, prose and, and I, I was uh, I mean, I wrote this round about the time of the first uh, the preparation for the uh, obscene um, invasion of Iraq. Uh, of Iraq. <clears throat> 20th of February. By mid-afternoon, I was chasing cage fever, so wrapped myself in several layers of clothing, leaving no flesh exposed to a writhing wind. Threw on a backpack and headed down Ricker's Gill through patches of wet bushes and stubborn heather to the snowland. As I descended to the steep, slippery banks of Graining Beck, the stream ran fast below the old stone line kilns. 
There was sufficient thaw to swell the waters, and I could hear the beck's busy echo long before seeing it. When I eased my way down, trying not to brush against clinging thistle, I slipped and instinctively grabbed at the earth to regain my balance and won a palm full of microscopic pricks in my paws. Further upstream, pre precisely placed heron's footprints in the snow. The bird had taken the same route and wondering how long they'd been there, I followed until the prints ended after a few yards amongst thin reeds at the quickening rush of the water's edge. The stream twists and turns and loses, and loses height suddenly so that many pools form and banks sheer without footing, but sometimes, as it momentarily flattens and meanders, there is a choice of banks to walk. I chose the east with a slightly steeper grassy slope, instead of the west with a flattened track through slippery shale. This is a choice I make every time, I thought, jumping from rock to rock across the stream and catching sight of the heron's imprint opposite. It too had taken this route, so I followed its tracks as the light dimmed. A heron crisscrosses the lashing psyche fast with sudden thaw, its spiky tread sunk in unscuffed snow. Patient and hungry as death, no inkling of urgency in its measured step, close and overlapping at the water's edge. The day had been cloudy mostly. It was now 3.30 p.m., 15 minutes from sunset, and a stiff and potentially hazardous climb to save footing before the night overtook. As I approached the tight and sudden confluence of those of three streams, a half moon slightly brightened the dark sky above the narrows. A heron flew past, painting air with its primaries, retracing its tracks and mine. With only the lunar half-light to find my footing up a narrow cliff, I stepped across rocks to higher ground until I reached the ziggurat-like track, winding up from the remains of a deserted bare right mine, which was my way out of there. A low jet rolled overhead, rehearsing a raid on Iraq. May the sacred river Ule mourn you, along whose banks we walk in our vigor. May the pure Euphrates mourn you, whose waters we poured in libation from skins. May the young men of Uruk the sheepfold mourn you, who saw us slay the bull of heaven. May the plowman mourn you in his furrows, when he sounds and sows your name in song. When I climbed up to the edge of the fell, I took a step into myself and found a predatory instinct. A sneaking wind was blowing around the top of the ziggurat, and to stay out of its icy bite for as long as possible, I descended again into the deep shadows of the narrow cloth to a sheep track, level with the stream which would provide shelter up the steep wind-ripped hill to the damp patch of its source where I would become exposed for the final mile home to the unfettered, unhindered, and unhinged gale. So, <clears throat> when I was um, putting my uh, collect collected poems together, uh, the, um, the, the, I, the, the the, uh, there was, uh, you know, there was very few, but some pleasures in doing it. You can follow me, aren't you? You sacked me. <laughs> Thanks. Oh fuck! I, has nobody heard what's going on? So far? <laughs> <laughs> Did he hear it at the bottom? Okay, because I hate to fucking have to do it again. <laughs> anyway, when I was doing me collect. 
these collected poems, and uh, I, I had a bit of fun rewriting a couple of thanks uh, of um, uh, doing new versions of old poems. So this is Cast Off, 1981, and uh, I was walking with uh, Allen Ginsberg and Peter Olofsky to go and visit Burroughs in the bunker, and it was like middle of January, and uh, you know we were in New York. And in the doorway, I saw what I thought was some poor soul uh, crouched over uh, and frozen. But it, it was a coat which was upright, uh, just as though someone was wearing it, but frozen. And I saw wrote this poem. Cast off, 1981. Crouched over in a bowery doorway, an old coat's forgotten. No one wears it anymore. This is cast off 2011. Crouched over in a bowery doorway, an old poet's forgotten. No one reads him anymore. <laughs> and uh, here's another I did a riff on. Advice to young poets from 1971. If your muse refuses to tickle your balls, says fuck yourself, take her advice and get on with it. <coughs> The Arts Council is the home of contortionists. <laughs> Advice to Young Poets 2008. <laughs> Moisturize. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wind rips. A telling wind rips at the window, your hand, my pillow, we come as the first thrush sings, springs in. Skint, I wanted to buy you a dark amaryllis, deep as a well of blood. I could not question, although I understood, but I was skint and wrote this instead. Absolute. Sunlight after sex. First frost on the fells. A crystal apron dissolves in a lap of certain light. Water in a bedroom cup. Cold, clear, and the air sure. This is, I, um, okay, I, I, was, I was, I did a reading uh, in Amsterdam with, uh, <coughs> with a marvelous international gig and um, Tom Ray with and Ted Rurigan and Ann Waldman and marvelous, wonderful people were there. But Ted, read this fucking interminable poem called <laughs> Train Right, you know. And I was dying to get to the bar, so I was somewhat irritated. So I wrote this response. Um, a poem by Tom's Ramoth and Pickard to Ted Berrigan, written during a train ride beneath, between Amsterdam and Den Haag in pursuit of a Polish visa. Anywhere is a bad place to be stuck. <laughs> okay, so this <clears throat> some of the more recent poems. Homage. Uh, I read this the other day, and I was so tired, uh, I said, this is a short haiku. Homage. <laughs> <laughs> a stripper strokes the slope of her hip, Hokusai painting Mount Fuji. Objet mm -hmm. trouvé. Don't get me wrong, neighbor. I'm not ripping the piss. I just want your dog 
to stop shitting on my step. I may be dissing it. It could be a bitch. I'm not saying it is. I just want her it to stop plopping the poop on my stoop. Um, this is uh, <clears throat> there was a. Uh, I mean, you know, you know, what's happening in the UK is as horrendously, poisonously reactionary as what you're experiencing here. And uh, it's been going on for a while, uh, a bit longer. And um, I wrote this in response to a, a UK uh, politician. UK is this racist, fucking fake nationalist bunch of twats, uh, posturing as a you know, political party. And they did have some people elected to the European uh, Parliament. One of the politicians being interviewed on TV talked about uh, an African country as um, Bongo Bongo land. You know, that, that's a level of these people. And uh, so I wrote this poem called, uh, I typed the title of the poem as Wonga Wonga land. Wonga, is, Wonga was this, um, uh, a loan company which was set up to um, give loans to poor people who could not otherwise borrow money. But it was like something like a two or three thousand percent interest. So it was basically loan sharks. And of course, people had to go to these loan sharks because the government had cut back on social security. So it was a bit of a pincer movement. And of course, these companies contributed to the Conservative Party fund, so it's you know, a nice old circle. And uh, a Gissi is a uh, northeast dialect for a pig. And, uh, um, and this is pretty much directed at the uh, DWP's Department of Work and Pensions, which is the, who are the people responsible for distributing welfare benefits. And uh, they created a hostile environment when Theresa May could not choose Home Secretary. <coughs> created a hostile environment for immigrants and a hostile environment for people claiming benefits. So, Wonga Wonga Land. Dr. Gobbles, with his jowly wobbles, wants to stop the sick and jobless quaffing from his gissy goblets and break their backs on the rock of his salvation. He serves a cold buffet of hot wars to pump the economy for further plunder and squanders young lives like bankers on a company junket. If the hungry were hung, he'd hang the anger out, incentivize the fuck off and die. Or just have a jousting match of polite poetry. Once they bled themselves for a cure, now they only bleed the poor. So I, I read that and somebody in Princeton and somebody asked me afterwards a really interesting question about political poetry, you know. And uh, they said, did you ever read directly to the enemy? <laughs> and uh, of course I never have. And uh, as much as I'd like to, not that I would do any fucking good, really. But the nearest I got to it was um, uh, a member of the House of Lords, um, I mean, a bit of a, a well, fucking absolute racist, put out a kind of a, a racist tweet about a year ago, one of a number, and I responded uh, with a tweet. So I suppose the nearest I got to confronting them directly. My response was, uh, Lord Sugar, Lord Sugar. You're a nasty wee bugger, or so I have heard. Mm -hmm. Rather short for a lord, but tall for a turd. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, find me after.
Um, so I now live um, close to this estuary and uh, you know, enjoy them, which is populated in winter by all these migrant birds, you know. And it's a great pleasure. So really a couple of poems from now. Uh, winter migrants. A mass of moth-eaten cloud, threadbare and spun across a bullish moon. An animal wakes when I walk in winter, wrap against the withering wind, solitary on a Solway flat. Winter migrants gather in long black lines along a silver sleek, heads held back, throats thrust towards an onshore rush. Occasionally cruciform, static in a flying wind as though an obeisance to the sea. Each tide a season and a pecking mark. They call as I approach an upright spelk on their shaft, retracing steps washed out by whimpering silt, gathering my notes and theirs. We scavenge ahead of our shadows, waiting for what the tide brings in or leaves out. Purple hedge cloud, edged gold, hung on silver slates of sand. Diverted leaps of light surrender water, risen from rivulets roofed from rage. Repealing waves repeat a curlew's estuary echo. Who but you and the winds wake? Mm. I'm going to read the this poem to encourage you to purchase. I was very proud that uh, Arthur Johnson, the master printer, who uh, last time I was here, which was some time ago, uh, 2007, was it? Long time ago. Yeah. Anyway, he, Alice did this beautiful uh, printing and broadside of uh, uh, one of the poems, uh, songs, really, from uh, uh, my book, Ballad of Jamie Allen. So I'm going to read it. Away, born is away. I ask my love to be my bride and come with me on the swelling tide to sail the seas and the ocean wide. Away, boys, away. I thought my love, my love would bless when I bought my love a crimson dress. But the crimson dress did not impress. Away, boys, away. I said I would not be his bride, so he stole me away on the reddening tide and sailed me out to the ocean wide. Away, boys, away. A storm blew up and we changed course. She ripped and tossed a raging horse. She <clears throat> she raged and threatened my demise, my love, my love, she did despise. I said I would not be his bride, then fell be calmed on the swelling tide. The music my wild piper plays drives the storm and stills the waves. Away, boys, away. So going to uh, finish with um, Back to Fiends Fell, uh, this poem called Lark and Merlin. Um, when I lived up in this wilderness and had the great pleasure of watching, occasionally seeing uh, these rare falcons, uh, Merlins, you know, I'm not a guy with a long beard, but uh, this beautiful, very small little falcons and they catch they can catch a swift in flight, they're remarkable creatures. But one day I watched and I saw um, um, one pursuing a skylock and um, the lock was singing all of the time it was being pursued. I couldn't believe it. So anyway, I mean not that it's got a great thing to do with the poem, but that was, that was a tight one. Uh, lock and uh, a wren perched on a hawthorn, 
Low enough to skip the scalping winds, sang a scalpel song. <coughs> sea frets drift sheer along shorelines. In a cafe with our customers, listening to hail and spray glass and wind and a waitress laugh, I fell to fell thinking. A sullen light through vapour thins a line of hills. The edge of everything is nothing, whipped by wind. Watched in a webcam bound to a bedpost gag on my shaft. Rose blush of roadkill rabbit insides out on Tom Academy. Cumulus in a tarn, its fast shadow flees far hills. A wave of sleep grass skiffs mist. My hand thought of her, a photograph waiting to happen. This come to kill wind rips at the root. Here she comes and there she goes, rushes bow to rhyme. I should shut down, close off, stop if I could. How quick the mist, how quick. My lover. The assassin is beautiful. She has come to kill me and I conquer. Just now she sleeps, but when she wakes, I'm dead. Her eyelids flitter as I prepare her portions, her delicious poisons. As she flew past a lake of her melodic nectar stuck to my wing, making flight for an instant sticky, but nothing preening couldn't fix. She asked about my heart, its evasive flight, but can I trust her with its secrets? And does the merlin in fast pursuit of its prey tell the fleeing lark it is enamoured of its song? Or the singing lark turn tail and fly into the falcon's talons. My heart, the cartographer, charts to the waterline. Is swept back as the tide turns, wiping the map blank, wave after moon drawn wave. Walking home, I stride these tracks with her tread. It has gone on for days, strumming rushes, taking up tails, taking them on, the fall of my foot on tufts. A stroke of light along a lawn, laying in under a long cloud. I accrete, like into limestone, its phagnum to peat. Late shadows gather in the dark, words unright as they are written, unspeak as they are spoken, song sprung from heart and lung to tongue, unsung. Drunk winds stumble over shuffling roofs, shake his sleep who dreams a lost love will not let go. Recurring swirls of all gold, blown light. You can't help but be in it as it opens and falls back on itself, unfolds and unsays, I do not want to die without writing the unwritten pleasure of water. Thanks for listening. Thanks very much.